Welcome to Brazil Atlantic's interviews, where we get to know the people behind and in front of the creative industries. We're your hosts, music web designer Ross Barber Smith from Scotland, owner of Electric Kiwi, where we create awesome custom websites for bands, artists, and musicians. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Electric Kiwi. And I'm singer songwriter and multi instrumentalist Marcia Novelli from Canada, a man who wears many hats, literally and figuratively. Uh, when I'm not releasing music under my own name or my side project, My Night Soundtrack, I'm producing and mixing records for other artists or directing and editing music videos and music documentaries. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Marcia Novelli. Indeed. Um, I hope you've all got Marcia's new EP, which came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but if you're still in the spending mood, we have some awesome shirts for you on our website, available in seven different colors. There's a link to them in our show notes, so go and get them. And please use the coupon code BTA Rocks, and you'll get ten percent off. As our way, as our little way of saying, <laughs> you try, thank you. You're trying to copy what I say. That's why. It was, yeah, it was, I, was, I just I didn't want you, you to feel so bad. Yeah. So you know, I. I purposely you know got my tongue in knots and, yeah uh, right 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 but. well thanks for mentioning my ep yeah, i'm really excited about it um and everyone can just go to my website uh, marcinavelli.com which was created by the wonderful ross barber smith over here of electric kiwi um and uh, you can actually preview the entirety of the ep and uh yeah you can also support my upcoming second full-length solo album um all the details are on my website so go check it out and uh yeah that'd be awesome We'd love to know what you think about it. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. Uh, so joining us this week out of Minnesota is Neil Hilborn, a college national poetry slam champion. That's a bit of a mouthful. In August of 2013, Neil's poem OCD went viral, garnering over 7 million views to date, making it one of the most viewed poems on YouTube. Neil is also the founder of Thistle, a McAllister literary magazine and has run numerous writing workshops with college and high school students. His work has been featured in publications such as Borderline Magazine and Orange Quarterly, and his debut full-length book, Our Numbered Days, is now available. We're excited to learn more about Neil's experiences as a poet and the advice he'd offer to his fellow creatives. So, welcome to the show, Neil. Thanks. Thanks for having me, all. I really appreciate it. Please tell us three things about yourself that everyone should know. That everyone should know. Um, I grew up in Texas, uh, so sometimes when I get really tired, the the Texas accent comes out a little bit. Um, let's see what else uh, I have. In addition to a bunch of mental health disorders, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, I have um, relatively severe brain damage from seven major concussions. And um, despite all that, I still bike everywhere all the time, um, and you can't stop me. So... <laughs> Yeah, I love that. That is awesome. <laughs> your video of your poem OCD went viral. Um, yes. Did you expect such a great reaction to it? And um, and how have you leveraged, you know, the exposure that you've had from that to sort of move things forward in your in your career? And let For me sure. interject to say that I cannot watch that video without getting goosebumps and teary eyed every time. Oh, Just, thank you. I think that's you and six million other yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> <feel the laughs> <same way. laughs> and that is directly why I needed to reach out to you and bring you on this show to talk because it's such a powerful, powerful performance. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny that that sort of that was the video that got a whole bunch of traction, right? Um, because like, especially it's especially strange because of that video that was recorded, I think we recorded it in 2013. Um, and like that was I'd already been performing it for like three years at that point. Like I wrote the poem, started writing it in 2010 um, and kind of finished editing it and really debuted it in 2011. And um, I like over over the the couple of years in there, like I'd competed with it for years at Poetry Slams um, and I'd I'd been on tour with it. So I'd probably perform that poem like hundreds of times. And I'd actually I technically retired that poem. Um, I was like never going to do it again. And then we happened to be at. Uh, um, a poetry tournament in Madison, Wisconsin. And Sam, the executive director of Button Poetry, was like, hey, Neil, I don't have a good video of OCD yet. Like, because I'd made, I'd made individual finals of this tournament. He was like, I don't have a good video of OCD. Just like, go up there and do it. And I was like, sure, Sam, whatever. And it was going to be the last time I ever performed it. Um, and then, <laughs> and then like a couple months later, like somebody just happened to post it to Reddit at the right time with the right title. Um, and it made the front page, like got 4 million views in a day. Um, and then because of it, I got contacted by booking agencies and publishers and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so it's, you know, it's kind of weird cause it's sort of gone viral twice now where like that first time was in 2013. Um, and because of it, I've just been touring full time, mostly at colleges, uh, but also at a bunch of venues. 
Um, I'm just doing poetry as my living, which is a crazy thing that I get to say. And, and, you know, back then we didn't know what we were doing. Like now, like when we record videos, we like hook into the soundboard and like actually record audio. And this one, we're like, oh, the shotgun mic's going to be fine in this loud, echoey room. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's a lesson though. It, it really, it's not about all the bells and whistles though. It really does come right. down to performance. And this goes along for uh, a musician. It comes down to an actor. It comes down to anyone. It comes down to getting that moment of truth that humanity that people could connect with and that's yeah, that's what impacted me so much because i'm someone who struggles with uh, uh mental illness as well and you know that's it was just so vulnerable and so true and so naked you know that that it i find that te- that takes bravery and uh you know that's why it it moves me every time i i see something just so beautiful like that uh which leads me to want to ask you about um mm-hmm. using using mental illness or I should say using art and poetry um, as a way to uh, maybe 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 maneuver bet- uh, through mental illness, better yep. understand it, to you know use art as therapy, which is something I've, I've done for years in my yep. music. I mean, I'd say 90% of everything I write about is, is somehow derived from my own struggles with uh, mental illness. So what I want to know about uh, from you is, um, you know, someone who has written about mental illness in your poetry, how important do you think it is for creatives and those in the public eye to talk about these issues? Oh, I think it's so important. I I think that um, the way that people get into conversations about maybe it's mental illness, maybe it's just their own mental state. Maybe like people just have trouble talking about their emotions, but they feel like, but they, because like two people have experienced this one like piece of art and it's caused them to feel like a similar emotion. Then they're able to open up about their feelings in general. Like, I, I feel like, I feel like art is the way into your internal state. Um, so like, yeah, I feel like if anybody's going to talk about it, it's gotta be artists. It's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I almost feel like it's a duty that we have. You know what I mean? Yes. I said mm. duty. Let's all be childish. Now. <laughs> duty. No, but so, seriously, like I, I feel like uh, we're not doing ourselves and anyone else justice if we don't dive into these deeper um emotions and right. psychological turmoil you know there's a lot of fluff out there there's a lot of garbage there's a lot of just music that makes people want to bounce their heads or movies that are just void of any truth you know right um so i think that i think the world needs that i think people need that and i think the more that we can normalize these sort of things the less suicides there are i know it sounds so extreme but yeah. it really is true the less someone feels so isolated and alone and crazy you know it, it I, I always tell people look i sort of go to such an extreme but if, if you found out you had cancer okay would you be embarrassed to tell people would you be embarrassed to tell people you're seeking help for that from a professional who deals with that every day no right. you know what i mean if you had any sort of ailment it, from the smallest you know, scratch on, on, on your skin to a broken bone, you know, you would go to a professional to heal that, you know, yeah, and you would, you wouldn't be embarrassed to tell people about that. So just because it's a, it, it's a, a mental scrape or a mental broken bone, you know, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you shouldn't be embarrassed to talk about that. And it, there's no shame in going to professional to seek help for that, to help Absolutely. heal, to help move through that. And also to find ways for you to, if you're an artist of any sort, to use that as a vehicle for expression to move through it and to help other people. Yeah. I'm very passionate sure, about this. So, so I, I'm going to be, yeah. I'm, I can't help it. It's something do your thing, dude. we are, we are completely on the same wavelength, man. That's, that's totally why I, I want to talk to you right now. Um, yeah. you know, so, so would you agree with that? Would you agree that it's, it's, it's just, it's a responsibility in a way? Yeah. Well, I also think that it's your responsibility as an artist to just tell your own story as, as openly and as genuinely as possible. Um, so, True. And, and I think that um, audiences and readers and listeners can always, always, always tell when you're trying to trick them, you know, like people like know when you're being disingenuous. Um, and so I've always thought is like my job as a, as a writer and a performer is to just tell, tell my story and just, and relate whatever I happen to be going through as just as as genuinely as i possibly can um because like that's that sort of specificity and and openness is what people are going to really connect with um so yeah man i think that like just gotta just gotta talk about your story and talk about what you're going through um absolutely um as long as as long as it feels true to you and as long as you really care about it like yeah right 
that's what people are going to connect with. Well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it needs to be your own story. Um, and I guess I just, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is if, if that, if part of your own story is dealing with some sort of mental illness or just, yeah, or like, or like you it. said, even just, <laughs> even if you if your mental state is just not in a great place or whatever, right. um, yeah, talk about it. Why not? Don't be ashamed. Yeah, man. Even if you're not an right. artist, even if you're just anyone, don't be ashamed to talk about it. And it yeah. doesn't mean that you're crazy. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with yeah. you. It just, you know, so that's our um, that's, uh, that's our public service announcement for for this yeah. episode <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um i heard somebody uh at a i was doing a ted talk once and somebody else um was he did a he did a thing where he's trying to sort of recontextualize mental illness and he talked specifically about um what's the term he used uh neuroatypicality um and you know sort of like just trying to just trying to like think of it not as like you are ill. It's like, Hey, this is just the way that your brain functions. And you know what? Sometimes it does, it does disrupt your day to day function. And that's right. when, that's when you go, that's when you talk to a professional. That's when you get somebody who really knows what's going on. But like, otherwise, if it's not messing up your day to day function, like it's not necessarily a wrong thing. You just got to figure out how your brain works and how, how you can, you can work with it to achieve whatever you're trying to achieve. You know, I know you, you know, you, you run workshops and, um, mm-hmm. I'd be curious to find out like, um, you know, as someone who runs workshops, do you find that there there seems to be like a common struggle that people that you, you work with have um, in terms of their creativity? And is there anything that you can do to overcome those kind of struggles? Yeah, um, I think especially in um, in writing workshops, uh, the, the thing that people come up against so often is like, you know, people are like, oh, I have writer's block or whatever, right? Um, but I think that writer's block is so often like, Cause like I, we, we know what's good, like within the art form that we're producing, like, you know, you know, what's supposed to be good. You know what it's supposed to sound like, but sometimes you come up and you like can't produce it. So I find often, at least when I have writer's block, I, I'm like bumping up against a cliche and I'm like, I can't write this cliche cause I know it's bad. Right. Um, and so I'm like, well, what else do I write? Cause all I can think of is this dumb line. And so I tell people, I'm like, dude, write the line. Like, get that brain garbage out because you know, like you're going to write that cliche and there's going to be another cliche behind it and something else behind that. But then like, once you get all that detritus out of your brain, then you can sit down and like actually write the stuff that you care about, you know? Um, so I say, yeah, that's, that's really, I'll say, I'm like, don't be afraid of the garbage, dude. Like this is, this is your own poem. You can go back and cut all that stuff later. Like nobody has to know that you wrote yeah, that. It's funny how we get it. We get, I totally read that. You get totally afraid of not writing something perfect. I don't know if it's something right. some people like myself deal with perfectionism and stuff, but it's still um, just write it, right? Or for me, write right. about having writer's block. <laughs> write yeah. about it. It's suddenly write, you have a topic. Whatever's in your, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just whatever's in your head, get it right. out. And then there's always going to be something behind it. You know, I, I think that that sort of idea of perfectionism is really it's really prevalent um, be, because so often people are like, everything that I create is a perfect reflection of who I am. So if right, this right. isn't perfect and I'm not, I'm like, dude, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think little, that right? a lot of it comes from like a fear of what other people are going to think or oh. other people are going to react to? Like, how yeah. do you combat that kind of thing because i guess so many creative people have that fear of right. someone's not going to like what i do but i i guess it's that it's coming to terms with not everyone's going to like everything that you do like right it's and that's a big part of it um i think that you know something i've I've actually learned from a lot of comedians um is that like bombing never killed anybody you know um like I, the times the times that have been the performances that have been most helpful to me in my career like aren't the ones that went really well because like, I know what that feels like, you know, it's the ones where like, everybody hated me and I like really right. failed miserably and they wanted me to go away, you know? Um, because I'm like, Oh, that really sucked, but it's over. Like <laughs> <laughs> nothing bad happened. I still got paid. So like, whatever, it's, it's, like, it's kind of an exposure, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of right, similar to like, what oh, you're doing exposure. <laughs> yeah. Exposure so it's therapy. like, Oh, cool. Like I'm not, you know, I failed and like, it didn't even, didn't even touch me, dude. Like I'm still fine. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I think, I think failing publicly is like really, really helpful. Cause like the first couple of times you think you're going to die and then you're like, no, I'm I, cool. I still got on my hands and stuff. This is fine. Like <laughs> <laughs> you're catastrophizing. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, what I did want to say is um, I wanted to share something uh, over the last year. I actually barely, I don't think I've written a complete song in, in the entire year, which is very rare for me. This hasn't happened in a long, long time. And yep. I think it was last week actually during a, my, a, my weekly therapy session. Um, it was brought up to me to why not write 
not for an audience, right? Just go back yeah, to man. writing completely for yourself. And, you know, it's been so long that I just sat down and wrote something, not thinking to ever share it. You know what I mean? Not thinking, okay, uh, that, you know what? This isn't good enough. I'm going to scrap that. I'm going to try something else. No, just go with mm-hmm. that, whatever you're going with, because it's just for me. Now, yeah, man. that's always been when the best stuff comes out and then it's not just for you, but you got to trick yourself. Mm-hmm. You got to be like, this is just for me. Who cares? Just, I'm not showing this it's to just, anybody. Like, it's never. This is, it's just for me. I'm just <laughs> chilling, dude. And, like, you know, I'm, I'm that's what we say, should do with all these interviews. Yeah, yeah, we should just pretend just that they're right. just for us. <laughs> right. It's, I mean, it's true. Because like, that's Don't when we? you allow yourself, <laughs> <laughs> that's when you allow yourself to get weird, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that it's, it's like allowing yourself to take risks is probably what got you in the position you're in in the first place. No, exactly. Because you're like, this is this might not work, but fuck it, man. I'm doing this. Well, like. you know, it's a catch twenty two because you start growing a bit more of an audience, and that's amazing. But then it, you know, for some of us, it also starts shifting you to be more, even more critical of your work. So mm-hmm. yep. maybe mm-hmm. that work minimizes. Like for me, just I used to write s- stupid amounts of 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 material uh, yep. when I first started out years ago. You know what I mean? And it slowly went lower and lower. Um, of course, I think the same with yourself. I'm sure the quality went up a bit as you know, as even if you wrote lower, just because you're doing it for longer. Sure. But, you know, it minimized so much that it's like, okay, this is definitely a fear. This is a fear yeah, of failure. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And yep. failure in any term, whether if failure can just being mean that you're going to write something that's not great and you're going to get down yourself or that's you're afraid people are not going to like it. So it's, you know, it's getting yourself out of that mindset. And I guess all I can share is my own experience of yeah. pretend like you're not writing it for anyone. Just write it for yourself. Right. And you're going to yeah, be the yeah. most honest and vulnerable And it's going to be the most therapeutic. And I'm happy that I have editors and have people that I've been working with for years. You know, generally, I'm good at what I do. Tell me if this is trash, though. So, Do you think that comes with you being more confident in what you're doing, though, um, over the years? Because, you know, I'm sure when you started out, and I can relate to this, if anyone said anything bad about what you're doing, you'd probably go into a ball and start crying you know what I mean? it's like i'm awful oh my god you know <laughs> i'm a terrible artist i know yeah, exactly sure. so like where does that validation come from it, that that's something i always I, i'm always curious about is the validation your own validation or do you think some of it has come from an outside source because you know it's it's that whole thing of confidence really needs to come from the inside yeah but you know so many so many artists actually need that outer validation um For sure. hopefully we can grow past that because what happens when that goes away so what i'm curious about <laughs> is do you find that you've become more confident because you're you're just more um, you like what you're doing, or do you think that it's because other people have given you that validation and told you you're good? Um, you know what happens if a ton of people start telling you that you're not good? Would that change what you think about your own art? You know, this is this. I think this applies to all artists, and it's a question we all need to ask ourselves. So I'd really like yeah. to know what you think about that. Um, well, I think that anybody especially if you're a performer and if you're somebody who gets up in public and does your stuff in front of people, if you're saying you don't want validation, you're lying. Right. Um, and I, I think that the trap, the trap is always depending on that validation um, to, to form the entirety of your opinion about yourself, you know? So like, I think that definitely like, you know, I've been, I've been touring full time for the last like three years or something. Um, and sort of, I think the, the part of the validation that's really helped is, seeing sort of a broad scope of people at a whole bunch of shows saying like your work means so much to me. Thanks for writing this. I really appreciate it. And not like any one individual thing, but like seeing a sort of general reaction of like people saying like, this is important. Keep doing it. That's, that's been a lot more motivating than anything one individual said, you know? Um, so, so is it the fact that you know that what you're doing is connecting to people? Is that what I got it kind of, is that the thing that keeps you going that makes you feel like, right. okay, you're onto something here because people are reciprocating that, um, feeling back to me. Yeah. It's, um, people saying like, it's people saying so often, like I really connected to this story. Like, thank, thanks for, thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for being so personal with it. Like that, that sort of validation. And, and granted, I'm still out here writing like weird ass poems about like sure. Casimir Pulaski and stuff like that, that like probably nobody's going to read, but I'm writing cause I'm excited about it. But like definitely it's, it's, it's encouraging for me to like continue writing spoken word pieces um, that I think people are going to connect with, you know, be- because, because like I see sort of the form of poems that I've written in the past that people are really into. Um, and so I feel I do feel motivated to keep writing in that genre because people are like, you're good at this genre. Keep doing it. You so know? the question now is, and I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, is 
Is there a part of pandering to an audience or is it part of you're an artist that, again, like myself, like Ross, like all of us, like many people listening to this right now, you're capable of writing and creating in many different different styles and art forms. Yeah. So is it really that maybe you're just focusing a little bit more on one particular style or you're just sharing that one particular style with people because you know that is what they're connecting with? Uh, some of both. Um, I think that I definitely, um, especially with poems, it's re- especially like spoken word poems, sort of the way the genre is going right now. It's I very much feel like there's there's a line you can really intentionally walk between sort of lyricality and, and accessibility, you know, and you want to be like kind of right in the middle. To me, it, it feels like um, it feels like I'm almost like filling out an equation. Like I know kind of what is supposed to go where, like where I'm supposed to do narrative to set up for like a big line, like where the sort of like where the, the big hammers and I'm supposed to swing are supposed to be. Right. Is that fully so, conscious like, though? Or is that kind of subconscious? It's so the, in the first few drafts that's subconscious, I'm not thinking about it. I'm like, just write whatever, write the narrative. And then when I get to editing and when I really start thinking about putting it in front of an audience, then it's a much more conscious decision where I'm like, I know how this form works. Um, it's left brain, but, right brain. It's kind of like, you know, you're letting the creativity flow, then you're fine tuning it. So it makes sense. Um, so, and, and I still like in those poems, I think are going to be accessible and that I think might be like hits or whatever, quote unquote. Um, but I, in those poems, I'm still thinking like, okay, how do I, how do I do something that people are going to, that people are going to get and people are going to connect with that I'm still like representing myself in. I was going to say, is there Um, still, is there still a selfishness in there though? And and I'm not saying that in a bad way. There needs to be, (laughs) I'm totally selfish when I write. I, I, I think it's like the selfishness at first and then. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the selflessness, you know, allowing people to connect with that or else yeah. it's just for your enjoyment. Right. And I, I think all the poems that I've written that people have connected the most with are the ones where I wrote, where I was like, these are my feelings. <laughs> and <Exactly>. then, <laughs> <laughs> um, people are like, those are my feelings too. I'm yeah. like, cool. <laughs> There's 7.5 so. <laughs> billion people in the world. You know what I mean? To think that we're the only ones that feel a particular thing is outrageous. J- you know yeah. I mean? Just, just bonkers. Like, yeah. And, and, how how egotistical is it to think like I'm so special? I'm the only person. Yeah. And that's <laughs> no just who's one... currently alive on the planet, right? <laughs> no yeah. one has ever been this particular type of sad before. Like, oh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> exactly. And on that note, are you ready for 20 questions? <laughs> Let's do this. All right. Coffee or tea? Uh, tea. Meat or veggies? Veggies. Twitter or Facebook? Twitter. <laughs> Texas or Minnesota? Ooh. Minnesota. Oh, God. Fencing or football? Fencing. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Education or experience? Oh. <laughs> oh experience. <laughs> the Wire or The Sopranos? The, the Wire. <laughs> fact or fiction? Fa- fact. Fact. Talent or attitude? Attitude. Attitude. Parks and Rec or 30 Rock? Oh, dude. <laughs> uh, Parks and Rec. <laughs> we asked the tough questions here. Yeah, we for did. sure. Uh-huh. We did. Batman or Superman? Batman. <laughs> Style or substance? Substance. Now, base this one on stuff I've seen on your Twitter. Okay. So, owls or unicorns? Bro. Oh. It's gotta be owls, man. <laughs> All right, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make one of us happy, or actually, you're gonna make a lot of people happy, or a lot of people upset with this one. But okay. Canada or Scotland? <laughs> well, I've never been to Scotland, and y'all have unicorns on your crest. <laughs> we so do. I'm gonna have to go with Scotland. I'm sorry. It's yeah. a ma- it's a mythical place. It's a little magical and mythical we, place. You know, we've got our, we've got our fair magical share of owls too. Scotland. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> So we've got the best of both. Plus, we have owls here too. You know? from Scotland, you know. Um, so I can't like love us. I'm like, oh, frightened rabbits from Scotland. Awesome. Right, yes, go. yes. So frightened anyway. rabbits are from Scotland. You are correct, <laughs> and they're very good. So anyone ding, who's ding, not ding, heard ding, them ding. should check them correct. out. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So now this, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm gonna just gonna you come straight out and say, don't it, yeah. I don't know how tough this one's gonna be no, for just you. Do it. I really have genuinely okay. no idea. All right, yeah, neither do I. Michael Jackson or Michael Bolton. Oh, dude. Uh, I mean, it's gotta. Th- you're right. This is hard. Like, it's gotta be MJ. But like, that's actually a very difficult question. <laughs> you know what? Th- this was. 
I, I, I'm going to say for me, it was a joke question for the first okay. like two and a half years of us doing the show. For Ross, it was for a sure. serious question. But since Michael Bolton has become aware of the show and has tweeted us a couple of times and <laughs> since his new like, well, it's not so new now, but the <laughs> Valentine's Day special on Netflix that came out featuring him, he's oh, kind of, you yeah, know, yeah. the Bolt's back. You know, the Bolt it's is true. back. Well, the the well, Bolt never the, fucking the, left, Marcio. The, <laughs> the Bolt has always been in the room. He's been in my heart this whole time, <laughs> Marcio. Bolt, I mean, listen, I can the go the distance you. with Michael Bolton. <laughs> I could it's, I could probably throw in some oh, more Michael Bolton. Puns it's becoming and it's becoming but, more of a real yeah. thing. You know what? We urge our audience, everyone, <sighs> go tweet Michael Bolton and tell him that you want to see <laughs> him on MB Bridget Sims, Atlantic. Tell him, take, tell him be, that we want us. him on the show. Yes, uh, I, and that you're not going to rest. You're not going to sleep. No, until he until he comes on. Just just mm-hmm. do it. Do it. Okay. Yeah. So Celine Dion or Marilyn Manson? Ooh, uh, Marilyn Manson, cause cause of all the dope stuff he said around Columbine is really like yeah, he's pretty awesome. You know, eh? Yeah, he's a, he's just smart dude, cool dude. For sure. Now this again, don't overthink it. Okay. Whale or kale? Whale or kale? Yeah, you can't mm. really understand it because yeah. of his accent. Cool. Whale. It's. A, <laughs> <laughs> I listen. Yeah. Uh, whale. It's got to be whales. <laughs> I love you, Ross. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> that Midler or the Riddler? Ooh. Oh man. <sighs> You have to go with Jim Carrey, the Riddler. And your final question. Mm -hmm. A little mini drum roll. Ross or Marcio? Neil. (laughs) Oh! You picked yourself. That's a good one. guess did that. Keaton Simons also picked himself. He says, you know, if you don't pick yourself, then... I can't remember what he said, but he, he started with you. Can't, <laughs> cool. That was like, a really perfect paraphrase. Yeah, something yeah, about you've got to love yourself. Wonderful uh, paraphrase. Yeah, that's, that's what I meant to do. Not like, I'm like, I can't do this. You can't, oh, you can't make me. <laughs> Neil, uh, so. very quickly before we wrap up, um, for anyone mm-hmm. who wants to do, um, you know, what you do or any sort of creative um, endeavor for a living, is there one quick piece of actionable advice you can offer them to get started? Yeah, accidentally get famous on the internet. No. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, no I mean, well, it's, it's kind of weird because, like, that's how I got really started. That's how I'm doing this as a career. But also, like, I think just say, saying it was just that ignores that I spent five years before that happened just going to every poetry show, every poetry tournament, every open mic I could get to and performing and just doing my poems hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, so I think more than anything, it's get out, getting out and just grinding with no no expectation of a reward but like just trying to just trying to improve and get better so it's that putting in all that work so that you can get lucky you know yeah i like that yeah i think i like that the zero expectations but you're working to achieve something towards something and yeah like, yeah now i was about to ask you where's the best place for people to connect with you online but i believe it's twitter yes right? I, so twitter um, the two places I'm most active are Twitter and Facebook. My Facebook is definitely like a good place to like see my work and see what's going on. Um, but like connecting but to connect me with you, connect you would be Twitter. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which um, is uh, it's Neilicorn, Neil Icorn. So unicorns. Uh, you know, I screwed that one up. <laughs> there but, we go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, Neilicorn. You're gonna have to change your Twitter name to Nowls or something. <laughs> <laughs> I do tweet a lot about owls, don't I? It's really yeah. They're cool. All right, whatever. Um. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Cool. We'll put all those links in the show notes so people can, can connect with you. Absolutely. Um, and as for us, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, YouTube, and Instagram, which I always forget to mention. Um, head over to our website. You'll find all the links to them there and pick up one of your shirts while you're... Wait, one of your shirts? One of our shirts. They will be their there. shirt. It will be your shirt. It will be your shirt, but at the moment it's it. in Marcio's basement, but it will be with you <laughs> once you order it and he sends it to you with love. <laughs> This is true. There's lots of love and an envelope, probably. <laughs> As for me, yeah. I have a brand new all acoustic EP called The Reimagining Volume One out now. Um, like I mentioned in the intro here, you can go preview the entire thing. Just go to my website, marcinavelli.com, which uh, you can also from there um, support my upcoming second full length solo album. Um, so make sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Spotify, which are all my name, Marcinavelli. And I'm working on websites for various artists at the moment. You can check out my work and my blog at electrickiwi.co.uk. You'll find me on Twitter and Instagram as Electric Kiwi and Facebook is Electric Kiwi Design. This episode was brought to you by 30 Roses, a virtual assistant and consultant to musicians and other creatives, as well as Chris Keaton, Joe Centenary, the rock star advocate, Buck Naked Soap Company and Social Surge. All links are in the show notes, so please do check them out because they help keep the show alive. And if you'd like to sponsor the show, 
help keep this show alive, then uh, visit patreon.com slash bridge the Atlantic. I'm not going to go on about keeping the show's heart pumping no, and all that stuff like I usually do. you've done that do. before and it's just like... I've done that uh, before and you loved it, but you just yeah, pretend well, like you, know you don't. What, you know what? Okay, look, Neil, thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> uh, it was welcome. a true pleasure. Seriously, thanks for being so open and honest um, with us as well as just in general. We need more people like you um, that are quote-unquote keeping it real. Thanks, man. <laughs> 